name is Simon Lunn, and my co-presenter is Robin Avila. We're both scientists here at Renovo involved in both project planning and data analysis. So we've worked with a wide range of problems that we've answered using our neurohistology pipeline. Through the course of the presentation today, in your GoToWebinar uh, menu box, you'll see a question box. Feel free to enter uh, questions there throughout the course, and we'll uh, address them at the end. So today, I'll give you a brief introduction into neurohistology and take you through some of the key considerations we think about when approaching a new uh, project. Then I'll hand over to Robin, who will take you through a case study on how we use histology to answer questions about mechanism of action in our demyelinating, remyelinating model of MS. And uh, we'll have a brief summary, and as I said, we'll have type of questions at the end. So at the fundamental core of any study into neurodegenerative disease, it's a simple question of how do we protect neurons? Histology allows us to visualize neurons in the context of their microenvironment during disease. Now the bigger, harder question is what's causing injury and how do we protect against it? So we can start to use neurohistology to answer some of those questions during preclinical studies. So one, what's happening in the disease model? If you're observing behavioral changes or increased survival, you may already know the main mechanism of your model. But with histology, you can zoom in and look to see if there are some areas that are more susceptible to disease than others. The second and third points go hand in hand when you're looking for data to include an IND application. And that is, is my drug having a significant therapeutic impact on disease? And how? What is the mechanism of action of a drug under physiological conditions? So what I would like to do now is take you through some of the key considerations we think about to ensure the best targeted, high-quality histology to meet individual project needs. In general, they fall into one of four categories, such as sample handling, i.e. how we're fixing and, and storing these the samples, the best staining decisions in terms of antibodies versus uh, histological stain, the target area, choosing your right region of interest. And then finally, how are you going to quantify an, all that information that we're getting? OK, so let's start with some tissue handling. I'm not going to go through all the pros and cons of the information on this slide. However, the old adage of the quality of what you get out of a project really depends on the quality of the tissue going in really is true. Most of the decisions, particularly on how to fix tissue, really are dictated by the types of stain you're going to use. For example, for the most part, for tissue, perfusion fixation with 4% PFA will work for the majority of antibodies. However, some tissues, such as muscle, respond less well to fixation, and snap freezing it may, be, may improve tissue morphology and staining quality. And finally, for some applications like 3D electromicroscopy that we'll touch on a little bit later on in the talk, these require a more stringent fixation to maintain the cellular ultrastructure during processing. Here at Renovo, our main IHC pipeline focuses on generating free-floating sections from PFA fixed tissue to ensure the best antibody penetration and the cleanest staining. So now that we've fixed and sectioned our tissue, the next consideration is making sure you're choosing the best stain to answer your question. There are many histological stains, such as H&E, silver stain, and Cressel violet, that can give you a lot of information about the health of your tissue. However, when you start asking questions about what's happening specifically in disease, Antibody staining can pick up where histological stains end. In this example here, you can see comparison in adjacent brain slices stained with either black gold, a very common myelin histological stain, versus PLP, the major uh, component of myelin. The PLP staining is developed with DAB to give a permanent high contrast stain. We can see in both of these stains there's lots of areas of myelin staining. However, when we take a closer look and make comparisons between the adjacent sections, we can start to clearly see 
uh, within the black gold staining, there are both areas of false negative staining, such as in the cortex, and also false positive, such as in this hippocampus. So it's always important to consider specifically the limitations of the stains you're using. So I've shown you a histological stain, an example, and an example of a single antibody stain. But some questions are also more about interaction between cells, neurons, the environment, or even at the intracellular level. And for those, double or triple fluorescent immune labeling can really highlight some of those interactions. Here are three examples. The first, which is has GFAP in red, uh, the astrocyte marker, and then PLP for those myelinated axons in green. The second is synaptophysin staining in green, along with the new N neuronal marker in red to start to let us look at synaptic load. And finally, in this muscle, we have some bungrotoxin and vesicular acetylcholine transporter to look at neuromuscular junction integrity. So what I've shown you here are just some examples of histological stains, single and also fluorescent stains. What type of stain either single DAB or fluorescent you use really depends on the specific question you want to ask. What I'd like to do now is take a couple of minutes and talk about choosing the correct region of interest and then some of the techniques we use to quantify the staining. So as we start to talk about choosing ROI, I'd like to first highlight that here at Renovo, we use whole slide imaging to capture our stained tissue. So while we are looking here at two hemispheres of two individual brains, we can easily isolate and then relate back any ROI of any shape we use for our quantification back to the whole stained uh, section. As well as providing, providing consistency in our ROI, it also gives great flexibility to quickly probe new potential areas of interest. On this slide, we have two examples of brains stained with PLP to look at malinated axons. On the left, a wild-type animal with dense staining. And then on the right, our MS model of demalination that demonstrates significantly less malinated axons. In our demalinated model, you can clearly see extensive loss of PLP staining, both in the hippocampus and throughout the whole cortex. However, when we look specifically at the cortex, there's one region where we see significantly more loss of PLP staining than others. Importantly for us, um, the, uh, this loss in this one particular region, brain to brain, is consistent and reproducible. This makes it an ideal region to measure changes in axon myelination. So while you may see some general changes in your staining, it's important to really hone in what area gives you the most reproducible data. To highlight this point further, I would like to show you one ROI we measure in the corpus callosum. Here's an example of a remyelinating corpus callosum stained with PPD. You can see the red arrows, both large and small myelinated axons that show up as small dark donuts. We've done extensive studies to narrow down the correct region of interest we want to quantify. Here you can see in our standard region an axon count of 344 myelinated axons. And animal to animal, we see this is very consistent. However, if we take a region even 100 microns rostrally, this can lead to dramatically different results of over 1,000 axons. So it's important when comparing animal to animal, group to group, that you're always comparing the same ROI. Over the last couple of slides, I've really labored the point about picking your ROI. And the region is very simple. You can have the best staining in the world, but if you don't understand your region of interest or are not consistent in that region of interest you're looking at, all your subsequent quantification is potentially subject to high variability. You may drown out real druckable effects. So now to the fun part, the quantification. Using histology at a gross level, we can get a lot of volumetric information. For example, here is a brain stained with crescent violet that's had an extensive traumatic brain injury. When we stack these images serially, we can compare the size of the lesions during disease or after treatment. Another example of volumetric uh, measurements 
is whole brain volume. As mice undergo neurodegeneration, brain atrophy can lead to changes in brain size that can be tracked by looking both at tissue volume and ventricle size. Another volumetric measurement is the estimate of how many cells or neurons are in a given structure. To determine the estimate of the total number of neurons within a structure, we have to turn to serology. Serology is a sampling method to count cells in a three-dimensional space using a two-dimensional image. Briefly, by counting cells in non-overlapping sections at set points throughout the structure, we can ensure we evenly sample the whole neuronal population. Here at Renovo, we've been working to incorporate optical dissector serology to address problems of volumetric counting. While serology is a gold standard for estimating cell numbers, it comes with a heavy trade-off in terms of the manpower needed to perform the analysis. So when it comes to quantifying the staining itself, how you proceed really depends on the question you're asking. If you're asking, a, is something turned on, a simple yes or no question, such as in this extreme example on the left of either one microglial staining in the corpus callosum, this can be answered quickly without the need for further quantification. But if the question is how much, like in this example of PLP staining in the remyelinating hippocampus, then automated quantification may be more suitable and sensitive to detect changes of those 10 to 20 percent. Here at Renovo, to answer those questions, we use blinded automated algorithms to analyze all our tissue. We generate custom validated algorithms for each stain. This removes both human error and potential bias as the data is only unblinded after the final image uh, quantification and QC is being done. Some stains like this microglial stain, either one in the corpus callosum, can lead to very dense staining that obscures individual cells. Counting individual cells in this type of staining is essentially impossible. However, there's still information within this image. And even if individual cells cannot be distinguished, area occupied can provide relative stain densities necessary to compare groups. Here I have an example of an algorithm to count individual cells. In this staining for GST pi, that stains oligodendrocytes in the corpus callosum, you can see individual cells outlined in red that our algorithm has identified on both shape and intensity. This can give an absolute number of cells in each image that can be presented as a density within your ROI. But how can we take this further? What extra information do we have in our images? Here's an example of QR staining in the hu human cortex. Here we had a more complex question about neuronal populations. This cell counting algorithm had some added criteria with respect to shape and size. This uh, analysis allows us to segregate data by size threshold and begin to understand the changes in neuronal populations during disease. What bin of cells is used for the analysis really depends on the questions that are being asked. On a cellular level, one of the pathophysiological hallmarks of many neurodegenerative diseases are intracellular aggregation, such as demonstrated in this example of Huntington staining. The joy of aggregations is the typically dense bodies of staining that can be segregated out from the and size of these aggregates. Our process here at Renovo, whenever we are presented with an opportunity to work with a new stain, is to work with both biological scientists and image analysis specialists to understand what challenges and importantly, what key features of a stain we can work with to provide the highest quality quantification possible. Despite the power of IHC, there are some questions that require higher resolution to pass out answers around que questions around axon health. A technology that we use to answer some of these questions of high resolution at Renovo is 3D electron microscopy. This technique gives us the resolution of EM with the capacity to reconstruct individual cells or axons where we can get precise measurements on parameters such as mitochondrial volumes, 
impact on health and synaptic load. So to wrap this part of the webinar up, and before I pass to Robin, what I'd like to summarize is today I've taken you through what we consider some of our key considerations for tissue handling to data capture and quantification. Considering all these steps will really increase the quality and consistency of any histological process. So next I'd like to hand over to Robin where she will take you in more detail down our MS histology pipeline along with introducing some new technology we're embracing here at Renovo to dive into your tissue. Robin? Thank you, Simon, and good afternoon, everybody. As Simon mentioned, I'll now take you through an example case study for assessing therapeutic interventions in multiple sclerosis to answer questions regarding mechanism of action. Before I dive into the case study, I want to first briefly go over some basic background of MS pathology. As most of you are aware, MS is a multifactorial disease involving the immune system and CNS tissue. One thought regarding MS disease progression <clears throat> is that the immune system attacks the elated endocytes, or more specifically, the myelin that protects and insulates the axon. This leads to the unmyelinated axons. When axons are unmyelinated, it leads to stress and eventually axonal degeneration. This confocal image where PLP is red, major myelin protein, and the axons are labeled green, there are areas clearly of myelination, which is yellow, but there's also areas of demyelination in green. This is where the axon eventually leads to axonal degeneration or transactions. This is visualized quite nicely with the enlarged ovoidal shape in green called an ovoid. This generation within the demyelinated axon region leads to the dying back of axons represented in the schematic on the right-hand side. It is thought that the axonal degeneration is the leading cause of neurological decline seen in MS patients. Therefore, the focus of therapeutic intervention has been targeted to either enhancing remyelination or creating an environment for neuroprotection. In this case study that, uh, the case study, we are utilizing a modified Cooper's own model that allows for the separation of peripheral immune system involvement and focuses this study specifically on neuroprotection and remyelination aspects of MS disease. Cuprazone is a toxicin that, when placed in the chow of mice, will cause mature oligodendrocyte death and demyelination in white matter and gray matter regions of the brain, more specifically the corpus callosum and hippocampal and cortex gray matter regions. This, mouse, this MS mouse model that we have developed recapitulates several features of MS and allows for a platform to study potential therapeutics that it either enhances remyelination or have neuroprotective properties. This schematic is showing potential points of intervention that we have developed for our MS model that can help start to understand how your drug impacts the pathway and examine possible me mechanisms of action of your experimental therapeutic. This MS mouse model starts with the injury. A ligand endocyte death sparks an initial response with the activation of microglia, macrophages, and astrocytes. So the question arises, what type of cell activation is occurring and what is the extent of activation? This IHD staining for I IBA1 microglia macrophage marker demonstrates that the activation at the time of entry, and as Simon mentioned earlier in the presentation, this is quantifiable and you will be able to determine if there is a difference in the injury response, and you might observe less activation with your potential therapeutic. Next, we can examine a ligand endocyte death caused by this injury. When examining if injury results in a ligand endocyte death or loss, staining using a ligand endocyte specific marker, GSTPI as you see here, can show a loss of a ligand endocyte due to the initial injury and that the number of ligand endocyte cells can be quantified and shown to have significant differences between your groups. If this is your point of intervention, and although the injury is still happening, your therapeutic could demonstrate preservation and protection of ligand endocytes at this step. As mentioned by Simon previously in the introduction, our MS model for neuroprotection and remyelination offers consistent and reliable ROI areas of demyelination in the hippocampus and cortex regions. 
These ROIs offer highly reproducible quantification of demyelination, and if your experimental therapeutic helps maintain the myelinated fibers after injury, you would observe a difference in myelinated fibers at this point. Given that myelin loss is our major branching point, this is where we typically have our endpoints to determine what pathway to examine further, either axonal injury or remyelination. If you determine that demyelination is not affected with your experimental therapeutic, you would next go down the pathway and look, examine how the loss of myelinated fibers could be affecting the ax axonal integrity. In our model, as a result of myelin loss, there's significant axonal degeneration, as you can see in this enlarged image, that is IHC image that is stained with SMI32 with the appearance of ovoid staining. And as I had mentioned before, this is a typical hallmark of axonal transections. As mentioned by Simon in the introduction, that we can create an automated analysis to quantify individual cells. In this case study, we are asking if their axonal ovoids would be able to be quantified. What we have determined is that axonal injury in terms of axonal transactions can be quantified as seen as the proof of concept study we conducted <clears throat> in collaboration with the TRAP lab at the Cleveland Clinic. In this study, we use a snapped fillin knockout animal that, ha that are known to have mitochondrial abnormalities that predispose, predispose them to axonal degeneration. What we have done here is show that the axonal ovoids are quantifiable and that the differences can be significant between the knockout and the control. Going back to our pathway for the points of intervention, you would be able to determine if this absence of myelin is there preservation of unmyelinated axons due to the experimental therapeutics by examining axonal transactions. The other major branching point that we typically examine in this model is remyelination. In our model, after demyelination, spontaneous remyelination will occur after Cooper's own toxin is removed from the chow. Remyelination can address the question regarding if the experimental therapeutic is enhancing remyelination and if this enhancement is significant above spontaneous remyelination or the control. We have conducted a proof of concept study that used a therapeutic T3 an active form of thyroid hormone and is believed to promote myelination through triggering cell cycle exit of ligand dendrocyte progenitor cells. To we used the T3 to determine if they would enhance remyelination after six weeks of treatment. Quantification of remyelination shows that there is a statistically significant increase in remyelination in the gray matter of the cortex in the hippocampal regions. I want to mention again that our model we have demyelinating, demyelination occurring within the gray and white matter regions, and that remyelination dynamics may not be the same within each region, so it's important to examine both. When examining the corpus callosum during remyelination, the number of myelinated fibers can be quantified at a higher level of magnification, as mentioned by Simon in the introduction. Quantification of myelinated fibers after six weeks of treatment with T3 shows an increase compared to the control. Again, remyelination can address the question regarding if the experimental therapeutic is enhancing remyelination and if this enhancement is significant above spontaneous remyelination and or the control. I want to switch to gears a little and talk to you about one of the new projects in development at Renovo. We are conducting a medium throughput assay for dendritic spine analysis using gene gun technology. Traditionally, EM was used to gather ultrastructural information regarding synaptic alterations and spine characteristics. You can see in this image we use serial block face imaging, or 3D EM, to reconstruct the hippocampal CA1 neurons with our model within a control in our model of remyelination. In this case, axons are demyelinated for prolonged periods of time that had an increase in spinal density, but their lengths and post synaptic volumes densities were reduced. This method gathers information at high resolution but at a cost with limited throughput. 
As I mentioned earlier, Golgi staining, or EM, which I've shown you in the previous slide, has been used to analyze spine structures. More recent studies have started focusing on using fluorescent labeling of neurons followed by confocal microscopy, which provides spine images of better resolution than the Golgi and a larger sampling size than the EM. As seen here in this general schematic of the process for gene gun analysis of dendritic spines, we start with the animal and rapidly, rapidly dissect coronal sections into 150 micron hippocampal sections. Using a gene gun that has been loaded with a lipophilic tracer, DIE, for labeling the neurons will be shot into an area of interest, in this case the CA1 region of the hippocampus. The dendritic spines then are then randomly sampled and imaged using optimized confocal acquisition. Serial stack images with step sizes around 100 nanometers are collected and projected to reconstruct a 3D image and obtaining measurements for spine density, length, and volume. This slide goes into a little more detail of the image analysis that I will briefly touch upon. This first image is the area of interest that was labeled with the DII for neurons. The dendritic segments are then separated from neighboring neural processes and randomly processed individually for further analysis. The image stacks from the individual, den individual dendritic spines are then converted into a 2D, 2D image. And then after optimized deconvolution and early data analysis, we are able to reconstruct a 3D model. Using software, in this case Neuron Studio, we are able to assess spine density, spine head diameter, and spine classifications such as mushroom stubby or thin. This technique will allow for the rapid analysis to assess spine architecture and density to examine how drugs affect neurons in vivo in large studies. So, I have gone, we have gone through a comprehensive overview of how we have established a neurohistological pipeline for from tissue collection to quantification and how we apply this during preclinical studies of our T3, uh, T3 in our model of MS. We briefly went over how decisions at each step can impact the overall study outcomes. And furthermore, we outlined the individual steps in an MS pathway that will allow you to start to answer the question regarding mechanism of action of your experimental therapeutic. We do not necessarily go through each point for every study unless the potential intervention point is known. We typically look for key indicators or inflection points, for example, myelin loss and how effective the potential therapeutic is, then determine if other steps would be worth pursuing. The principles that we have developed for MS can be applied to other neurodegenerate diseases. We have looked at EAE and the immune-related injury and how it leads to ligandocyte death and myelin loss within the spinal cord. The rapid spine assay that I showed you today shows how a high content platform can be used to determine a compound's effect on dendritic spine shape and synapse function. I hope that you have a better understand, understanding of how you can take your immunohistochemistry chemistry one step further to investigate this mechanism of action. Although I have talked mostly on our MS models, this slide gives you a snapshot of other projects we have worked on ranging from Huntington's disease all the way to Alzheimer's disease and, for example, quantifying plaques. We have also completed projects ranging from clinical tissues in our ALS study to rodent tissues in our MS studies. I want to thank everyone at Renovo's scientific team that has completed all the data that was shown during our talk today. I want to thank you again for attending this webinar this, this afternoon. Now if there are any questions, Simon and I will be happy to answer them. Yes, yeah, so I'll remind you again that uh, there is a question box within your GoToWebinar uh, control panel. Uh, just while we wait to see if anyone has any questions, uh, one question that came up from the last webinar that I thought I'd like to address was the, the question of 
uh, sample size when you're doing quantification of the histological study. Now, is an N of three significant? Is that going to give you significant quantifiable differences? And that's a difficult question to answer because it really depends on the level of the stain, the, the exact staining in terms of, of what it is you're, you're looking at, and then how consistent is that staining within your region of interest and between animals. So you can do a power analysis uh, to look to see how many animals you need in a study, although this can be kind of difficult, especially if you have a new antibody that you don't know what those quantifiable levels are because you need both to know what the level is and the, the expected sand deviation to get an accurate um, reading. Now, as a general guide, I will say in our experience, for the majority of our stains, where we're taking four ROIs per animal, we have a standard group size between eight and 12. And that tends to be a really good range where we can do multiple different types of stain and get good quantifiable differences throughout our study. So um, I know that was a question that we had come up in the past. Uh, we have a question by email here, and this is a more specific one that maybe Robin can field. Uh, do you have any other markers for macrophages or immune-related uh, injury? Oh yes, we have. We can use. Um, we have F four eighty Mac two and uh, multiple markers for other statings, um, you know, CD45 and other things. And if you have a specific antibody that we haven't worked with, we, we definitely optimize and validate our algorithms um, along with doing your study. So can you distinguish M1 from M2 microglia? Robin, do you have an answer for that? Yeah. Um, you know, I we haven't. We haven't had we but I'm um, I would have to look into I actually don't know that answer. I would have to look into it and get back to you, but um we haven't specifically in any of the studies that we have done recently. Yeah, so so uh, I would say feel free to reach out. We have an email here on this final slide, which is bd at renovoneural.com. And if you do have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we can try to get some answers for you. Okay, so thank you once more for taking time out of your day to join us and enjoy the rest of your evening.